um, as we prepare our hearts to celebrate the birth of Christ, we're doing this sermon series about God's big story. And so last week, we did a quick overview of the entire Bible in 30 minutes. Um, and we saw that God is in control of the past, he's actively involved in the present, and he has a plan for the future. And so God's big story has four chapters, creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. And, you know, the beginning of your Bible has only a few pages, just this many, that talk about creation, how God created a world that was perfect. And then at the end of your Bible, there's just a few pages that talk about the future when everything that is broken will be repaired. But we live in this part of the Bible, <laughs> right? We live in the part of the Bible that describes brokenness and pain and shame. And so every part of the world, people ask, human beings have been asking the same questions. They ask, where did everything come from? And different religions and people have different answers. The other question every human being asks is, why is the world beautiful but broken? So to answer question one, I want to begin with the beauty and goodness of God's creation. So listen to the very first words of the Bible. You've probably heard them before, but listen with fresh ears. Fresh ears. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds, and it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. So let's read Isaiah 40 verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let me pray. Father, would you please send the Holy Spirit? We need him to open our minds and our hearts to the truth of your word. Would you bless us with wisdom and understanding so we can glorify you in everything we do? And we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. So when I was in college, I studied English literature, and in English grammar, a sentence has to have a subject and a verb and an object. So in the sentence, John ate cookies, John is the subject, ate is the verb, cookies are the object. So Genesis 1, verse 3, God said, let there be light, and there was light. So, in that sentence, and on every day of creation, who is the subject of the sentence? God is the subject. He created everything that exists, and he did it out of nothing. 
And the first things that God created are the objects in each of the sentences. Light and earth and sea and plants and animals. And what's the verb in every one of those sentences? Said. So to make all of these good things, all that God had to do was speak words. He just spoke words. And friends, God is speaking to you here. In this Bible, he continues to speak. And he explains creation to us with his words. And so we don't have to wonder, where did everything come from? Because the same God who spoke everything into existence speaks to us about how and why he made everything. Now, before God began this work of creation, the universe was dark, it was cold, and it was empty. And the, so the first thing God made was like a frame and a canvas. Before an artist can paint something beautiful, she needs something to paint on. And so the first five days of creation, God first created a universe. He made a canvas. He made this planet. And it was perfectly designed for life. He made a habitat. And then into this habitat, he put inhabitants. He designed birds for the air. He designed fish for the sea and animals for the land. And he gave each of them the perfect food to eat. Now, you know all this. Why am I telling you this? But I, I just want you to see that everything had a purpose and that all the purposes were interconnected. And that's why at the end of each day, God said that the creation was good. It was a good creation. Revelation 4.11 tells us why God created the world. It says, you are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor, and power. Why? For you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. So there's two things I see in that verse. One is God created what pleased him. He could have made three kinds of flowers and four kinds of birds. Instead, he made thousands of different flowers, thousands of different birds in different colors and shapes. Why? Just for the pure joy of creating. It pleased him to create beauty. And we're pleased by God's creation. We get to use these good things that he made for us. Right? We, we use the iron and the wood and the cotton. We make tools and furniture and clothes. We appreciate God's creation when we sip our coffee in the morning. Aren't you grateful to God when you sip that first <laughs> sip of coffee? Right? When you eat a good meal with your friends, you're enjoying the good gift of God's creation. And so, friends, when we use God's good gifts, we honor and glorify him. That's the second thing I see in Revelation 4.11, that God should receive glory and honor simply for being the creator. And the blasphemy of pagan religions is that they worship created things instead of the creator. See, instead of worshiping the moon and the stars, we worship the one who hung them in the sky by the simple power of his word. Now, during the first five days of creation, God called everything he made good. But his creation wasn't complete until day six, when he made people. So listen to Genesis 1, 26 to 31. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth 
and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They'll be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. So, after God made the sea and the sky and the land and the stars, he said it was good. But when God added human beings to the world, he said that creation was very good. What does that mean? It means that we are the best part of God's creation. Do you believe that about yourself? We are the best part of God's creation. You are not a monkey with a bigger brain. You're not. You are a unique creation. You are blessed by God to be a blessing to one another and to this world. Now, the first people who ever heard Genesis 1, the first people who ever heard this struggled to believe that they were very good. Do you know why? Because Moses wrote Genesis while he was in the desert with thousands and thousands of former human slaves. The Egyptians used and abused those people for 400 years like animals. But God had a message for his people in the desert. He had a message in the creation account. And the same message is for us. In Genesis, God is saying through Moses to his people in the desert and to us today, God is saying, you are not an accident. You are not animals. You are not worthless slaves. He says, you were made in my image. Therefore, you have dignity and value. You have a purpose. Everything God makes has a purpose. And God was telling his people in the desert, don't worship the sun like the Egyptians did. Worship me and me alone. I made the sun and I made you in love with a purpose. Read with me what David says about just how special human beings are in God's eyes. Would you read this with me? When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them, human beings that you should care for them, Yet you made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge over everything you made, putting all things under their authority, the flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and everything that swims the ocean currents. O oh Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Amen. Amen. All right, so we have answered question one briefly. But where did everything come from? We've answered that. Now, question two. Why is the world beautiful but broken? Have you ever held a newborn baby? And have you looked at those fingers and looked at those toes, at how perfect they are? It just, it fills your heart with wonder, doesn't it? At the miracle of God's good creation. Or maybe you've watched the sun set over the mountains or over the ocean. How do you feel when that evening sky is filled with this gorgeous display of colors? You feel awe and peace and joy. 
We feel that way because we're witnessing the goodness of God's creation in things like that. But how do you feel when you go to a funeral? Even if the person who has died is 90 years old, 95 years old, don't we still struggle to understand why they're gone? It feels wrong that they're dead, doesn't it? It feels wrong that I'm never going to be able to speak to this person again. See, the world feels broken to us, doesn't it? And we don't know why. An atheist will tell you that there's no God, and therefore death is just part of nature. It's just part of how the natural world works, so get used to it. But when, when a child is born with a birth defect, or a child dies, we don't say, oh, it's just the randomness of nature. What will you do? Right? We feel that something is deeply wrong in the world. Or maybe when a hurricane just brings random destruction and death out of nowhere, don't you feel in your gut that something is wrong in the world? that it shouldn't be this way. I don't know your story. I don't know how you personally have experienced the brokenness of this world. But I know that most of us at some point have suffered and cried like David does in Psalm 6. Would you read this with me? My soul is in deep anguish. How long, Lord, how long? I am worn out from my groaning. All night long I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. Friends, every human heart asks that same question. How long, Lord? How long? Waiting on the Lord to answer. And it's because every human soul carries a memory of the garden and a longing for the city of heaven. And David teaches us how to respond to suffering as we live between the garden and the city. How do we do that? We have to seek God's face. Not give in to the temptation of blaming God, or just denying that he exists. Because the suffering of the world is not God's fault. He made a perfect habitat. We read about it. He lovingly designed each inhabitant to live there. The reason the world is broken is that human beings turned their back on the creator. And we're going to look more closely at that next week in chapter 2. But for today, hear how the Apostle Paul explains why is the world broken. He says in Romans 1.20, Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, divine nature, they've been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him, and their thinking became futile, their foolish hearts were darkened, and they exchanged the cr truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator, who is forever praised. Amen. See, the reason the world is broken, friends, is that human hearts deny what is imprinted on our hearts from birth, that God is a good creator and he deserves glory and thanks and worship. But all of us, in different ways, choose to worship the creation instead of the creator. And so the reason the world is broken, the reason our hearts are broken, is because our relationship with the creator is broken. We all exchange truth for lies 
We spend time and money seeking comfort for today and security for tomorrow. We chase after a feeling of peace that always escapes us. This hunger for peace is even reflected in the way we speak to one another. In um, Hebrew, the word shalom is used to say hello and goodbye. And shalom means peace. But it's richer than that, the word. It means more than the absence of conflict. The word shalom means what it's like when everything is in the right place and everyone and everything is functioning according to God's purpose and design. Everything is working according to God's design. Now, Arabic has a word related to shalom, used as a greeting in many, many countries in the world. They say salam, right? So billions of people in this broken world are walking around every day saying peace, peace, peace to each other. And in Spanish, when Spanish speakers say goodbye to one another, they say adios, which means go with God. The English word goodbye, you might not know, is a contraction of God be with you. Why am I telling you all this? I think the way that we say hello and goodbye reveals something about our hearts. That baked into human language is a reminder that true peace and true security are impossible without God. It's baked into the way we speak. That's why the Lord's Prayer includes this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When Jesus taught us to pray, we, he taught us to acknowledge the brokenness and to pray out of a deep desire that God will come and heal this broken creation. And that healing began on Christmas morning. On Christmas morning, the creator became a creature. The living word left the security and eternal peace of heaven to enter this broken world. And then during his life, Jesus did right everything you do wrong. And he died as an innocent sacrifice to save the guilty, you and me. The Son of God was born to be broken so he could heal our brokenness. When he was on earth, Jesus healed the blind. He fed the hungry. He raised the dead. Every miracle was a reminder that God has not abandoned his broken creation. For example, when Jesus raised a little girl from the dead, what was he doing? He was correcting what was wrong. He was correcting what should not be. That little girl should not be dead. And he corrected what was wrong. And so her weeping parents suddenly experienced perfect shalom. They experienced peace. Their tears were stopped by the same one who will one day wipe every tear from our eyes. See, every miracle of Jesus was a reminder of the garden and it was a little taste of the city to come. The last chapter of God's big story is restoration. And the book of Revelation is really like a movie trailer, I think, that God let the Apostle John see a movie trailer. Uh, it was like a preview of our heavenly destiny. Listen to Revelation 21 some of these verses. This is what John says. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, 
God's dwelling place is now among the people. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. The city doesn't need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and the lamb is its lamp. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter the city, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So friends, as we finish, if you have trusted in the Lamb of God for the forgiveness of your sins, then your name is in his book of life. Amen. And your citizenship in that eternal city begins now. You got your visa. It, but if you are still searching, if you're still trying to find answers to explain the world's brokenness, then Jesus has an invitation for you. Jesus has a message for everyone who feels the weight of the fallen world. He says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus offers eternal rest and eternal hope. And if you want to survive the journey through this world of pain, you need a shepherd. You can't walk through the valley of darkness and death and come out the other side unless Jesus is your guide. And Jesus is here today, friends. He's leading his people all who have trusted in his name. He's leading us on the road from the garden to the city. And it is not a journey you want to take by yourself. But you'll never be alone if Jesus is your shepherd, your savior, and your friend. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for coming to this broken world to heal our brokenness. Father, thank you that you created the world and us in love would you forgive us for our pride and our unbelief? Would you help us believe that your design for the world and for human beings is good? Help us live according to your design. Help us love others. Help us bring you glory in all we do. We pray in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen.